Hello and welcome to our webinar, The Antimicrobial Resistance Crisis, Transitioning from Blame Game to Synergistic Solutions, hosted by Wiley and the American Society for Microbiology. I'm Megan Angelini, Managing Developmental Editor for ASM Books, and we're so pleased you can join us today. So now please allow me to introduce today's speakers and authors of the book, Revenge of the Microbes, How Bacterial Resistance is Undermining the Antibiotic Miracle, Brenda Wilson and Brian Ho. Dr. Wilson is currently at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she is a professor of microbiology and associate director of undergraduate education in the School of Molecular and Cellular Biology, an inaugural professor of biomedical and translation science in the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, a professor of pathobiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and senior faculty fellow in the office of the vice chancellor for research and innovation. Dr. Ho is currently a lecturer in bacteriology at the Institute of Structural and Molecular Biology of the University College London and Birkbeck College, University of London. We're so happy to have them here for this webinar. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Brian and I are delighted that you all could join us today for what we think is an important conversation about a very critical topic that is antimicrobial resistance and the crisis that we're currently in. So over the past couple of decades, we all have been hearing that we're in this midst of a crisis. Um, and we've been hearing a lot of blame being issued around. Um, but we think that it is now time to go beyond the blame game and actually move towards finding more viable solutions and being able to work together um, to do this. And so to begin this conversation, um, we think it is important to clarify just what is at stake and to introduce the largest stakeholders, that is us. Um, and so I think that um, if you just look at the current numbers, it tells pretty much all the story. Um, the total number of deaths uh, globally due to antibiotic resistant infections is topping <laughs> 5 million a year. Um, and that was in 2019. Um, and it's really only fourth among some of the biggest you know, uh, natural causes like cancers and heart disease and stroke. Um, and so this is a very, very you know, scary number. But just to think about it in terms of uh, in the United States alone, uh, some more recent numbers, um, the national estimate is, is again about 5 million infections a year that are either antibiotic resistant or related to the use of antibiotics. Um, and the death toll is, is again over five, uh, 50, uh, thousand uh, deaths. And so we are really truly right now, actually, I think in the midst of this crisis. Um, and certainly the, the COVID pandemic did not help us at all in, the, in, in this uh, battle that we are now facing. And so, um, you know, I, 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 we wanted to maybe also bring this a little bit home uh, to the, on the more personal level. And so I'd like you to meet Amy Copeland. Um, I have known about Amy since uh, 2012 when uh, she uh, actually came into the news because of uh, this flesh eating bacterial infection that she had. Um, and at the time she was a very healthy uh, 24 year old graduate student uh, in Georgia who went on zip lining uh, adventure and fell into some rocks in the in a river and lacerated her her uh, leg very badly, requiring about twenty stitches or so. Um, and she, you know, after getting her stitches, she was prescribed some antibiotics and she was, you know, released to go home. And a few days later, um, she was basically in dire straits in the emergency room, as uh, suffering from severe sepsis. Um, this uh, continued, uh, resulting in um, uh, kidney failure, heart failure, multiple heart failures, actually, um, and a number of amputations. Um, and in fact, you know, slowly she was able to recover, but basically the consequences of this um, infection led to the loss of every single one of her limbs. 
Um, she's doing well now, um, but it is taking 10 years for her to actually come to the state where she is, is now um, a, a strong advocate for uh, those who, who uh, you know, suffer from these kinds of consequences. And I encourage you to check, check out her website um, for this. Now, what was the culprit here? Well, the culprit was um, a toxin producing environmental bacterium that uh, is actually naturally highly resistant to antibiotics called Aramonas hydrophila. Um, this uh, you know, uh, organism has been increasingly reported um, in clinical isolates and as uh, having multi-drug resistance. So when talking about what was going on in, during Amy's infection, they started off with take-home antibiotics you know, over the counter that, you know, prescribed for her. Um, but um, she then went into the hospital and they still prescribed additional antibiotics. So there were multi-drugs that were, were administered to her and not very effective. Um, and it took a lot of work to get her to be able to recover. Um, so what are the clinical consequences of, of uh, antimicrobial drug resistance? Well, the doctors in these cases have to resort to uh, non-first-line antibiotics um, because obviously the first line that they tried in the beginning didn't work. And so now they must resort to second and third choice uh, drugs for treatment. Um, and unfortunately, many of these uh, alternatives are uh, less effective more toxic because causing you know a number of side effects and more expensive and just to, to you know for another example um, in in organisms that are naturally antibiotic resistant you then have on top of that um, only a few drugs that actually will work in their cases and and one example of that is actually tuberculosis so um, I'd like for you to meet Dr. Daleen uh, Von Delft, who was at the time that she was diagnosed with uh, multi-drug resistant uh, tuberculosis. She uh, started out as a new medical doctor in Cape Town, South Africa, where she contracted the, the disease. Um, and uh, despite having access to the best healthcare and treatments, that took, it took 19 long months, uh, very stressful months, sorry, um, in which she had to resort to toxic second line antibiotics for, for getting treatments. And some of these actually had side effects that would cause deafness uh, in, in this case. Luckily for her, because she was actually at a, a top notch uh, clinical uh, setting, she was able to get some, um, at, at the time, uh, a new, drug treatments and, and she was able to survive and she's now leading uh, uh, an organization trying to help with uh, battling uh, the tuberculosis uh, 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 multi-drug resistance efforts. Um, so what was going on here? Well, we're talking about in the case of TB, TB there are only really four or now there's about five or six uh, first line antibiotics. Um, two of those in this particular case, which are the most potent ones, uh, the isoniazid and, and rifampicin, they, the, the infection was resistant to. Um, that led to you know, needing to use secondary um, ones. And what we're finding now is that the, the move towards even more resistances, um, limiting again treatment options for uh, tuber uh, tuberculosis um, really is actually very problematic. And, and this is due to when you have an infection, especially in immune compromised individuals, such as those that have HIV, it's pretty much a death sentence because you can't control the infections. And in fact, tuberculosis is, is now responsible for about a third of the HIV related deaths in the world. Um, so, the really scary problem here, okay, is this increasing instance of multi-drug resistance. And when we say multi-drug, we don't just mean just one class. Like we have, you know, ampicillin and and penicillin resistance, and, and you know, those are all the same class of antibiotics, like at beta lactams. We're talking about resistance to multiple different kinds 
of uh, classes of drugs. And uh, when you have two or more, at least in, in these organisms, we, call, we refer to it as multi-drug resistance. But what we're seeing more and more is extensive drug resistance, where it's now more than three uh, classes uh, in many cases. And some are what we call the superbugs. Um, and these, you know, uh, and, and especially those that are uh, circulating now in, in hospital environments, uh, we refer to them as the SCAPE pathogens, simply because the, the, the acronym is, is uh, the first letter of the, the genus name for each of the, the or, these organisms, which are both gram positive as well as gram negative. So there's a, it's a broad spectrum of types of bacteria that have these kinds of resistances. Um, and uh, they're becoming increasingly problematic for uh, hospital settings. Um, and, and just to give you an example, of one of these superbugs that has, has emerged. Um, it actually came about in um, the 2000s uh, where uh, it, and in fact, it actually happened in the Middle East uh, during some military uh, uh, in, um, uh, in encounters where the soldiers uh, that were in this region were actually having uh, uh, infections that should not have actually cause serious problems because most of the injuries were actually relatively minor and they should not have needed to actually be hospitalized. But in this case, the soldiers were coming to a very highly virulent pan resistant, and by pan resistance, we mean resistant to all of the available drugs that they had on, at hand. And these is, uh, was the soil bacterium, Acinetobacter baumani. And over, you know, uh, 700 soldiers had bloodstream infections due to this uh, new deadly pathogen. Um, and it, they were immediately, they were transported to military hospitals, first in Germany and then in the United States. Um, and in additional cases happened in Canadian and British military as well. Um, and that soon after that, um, these types of infections rapidly spread to other civilian hospitals, not just military hospitals. And had very high mortality rates of up to you know, 23%, which makes this a very, very rapidly growing type of infection. And, and now it's global. It's, it's uh, everywhere that we can see. Um, and so uh, the instance that we have these resistant strains, and particularly when individuals end up in the hospital, it can rapidly spread through additional um, uh, vulnerable populations and, and makes it very deadly and very, very costly for us. Um, so one thing that's kind of important to think about when we start looking at these, the emergence of these kind of um, antibiotics or antibiotic resistant bacteria like Acinetobacter or even Aeromonas is that these are kind of environmental bacteria or what are typically thought of as being environmental bacteria. And so the kind of question that it comes up is like, well, why are these environmental bacteria now becoming antibiotic resistant? And one thing that a lot of people sort of start pointing to is the fact that we're actually administering antibiotics into the environment at a pretty high level um, through the course of various different pur uh, purposes, but most notably um, agriculture. So in, in, in reality, probably the largest volume of antibiotic usage probably can be attributed to um, when, when people give them to animals to uh, almost prophylactically to prevent uh, these animals from um, uh, from getting sick so that they are able to, you know, have a um, um, very high density uh, growth of, you know, or, or farming of animals. Um, and so one really important thing to think about with these cases is that not only are you, uh, is, is agriculture kind of not as tightly controlled in terms of what kind of antibiotics are being used at all the time, um, but also the the sheer volume of cases that these animals are dealing with results in the cases where you're effectively selecting for uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria within these populations. And on top of that, all these antibiotics that are being administered to animals will eventually wind up and either run off or in wastewater or in, in directly into the environment where there's even further now selection of antibiotic resistant environmental bacteria. And the other thing to think about when we talk about, you know, uh, agricultural use of antibiotics is that, well, 
you know, a lot of these animals very directly end up, you know, as being consumed by people. And so there's a very easy path for antibiotic resistant bacteria that are existing out in, in farms or in, in the environment to then naturally wind up interfacing or interacting with the antibiotics that will, uh, or the, the, the bacteria that will uh, colonize people as well through, through this uh, distribution through the, the food sources. Um, and, um, and so one thing that we, we like to think about when we are, uh, are uh, studying the antibiotic resistance is we, we kind of are asking the question of, well, where does this antibiotic resistance originally come from? And so the one important thing to think about is that a lot of the, the uh, antibiotics that we have and are currently using are all almost always derived from natural products, meaning that these are derivatives or related compounds to uh, antibiotic or molecules that exist in nature already. So in a way, a lot of the resistances to these antibiotics in a way are already existing out in the environment. It's just a matter of them not being very common or frequent. But as soon as you start introducing antibiotics out into the environment or into populations, um, effectively you can start killing off anything that's not resistant to it, allowing for resistant bacteria to now emerge as dominant members of the population. And the big problem with that is that once you start uh, having a single antibiotic resistant population there, um, they can never go away, right? They're always, almost always gonna be stuck sitting out there in, into the, the environment. And uh, on top of that, uh, a lot of the, the genes that encode these antibiotic resistance factors um, oftentimes end up on mobile genetic elements or are able to be transferred from one bacterium to another. Uh, either through directly delivering these things or through um, uh, uh, basically the ability of bacteria to take up uh, ex uh, extracellular DNA. So effectively, once you start selecting for individual antibiotic, individual antibiotic resistant bacteria, very quickly you're going to have that antibiotic resistance spread throughout all sorts of different bacteria. And that's likely what's effectively has happened in, in the case of, of um, many of these newly emerging uh, pathogens that are, are uh, arising. And so to kind of give just an example of the, the, the speed at which this is occurring, um, I'm going to show you here a, a, an example uh, of specifically of just uh, Staphylococcus. Um, so hope this is one of the uh, very well-known cases of MRSA or MRSA infections. Um, and these infections are typically like um, skin type infections, for example, uh, here you have an, a case where uh, Professor Jeff Gardner, a professor at Illinois, uh, had an infection and it basically would be, it turned out to be antibiotic resistant and therefore the only way to actually treat and deal with this infection was to literally cut away your, your tissue that is infected until you know eventually you can get rid of enough of it that, that the immune system is able to finish, finish the job. Um, but what's particularly notable about this case is that for throughout history of every single time an antibiotic uh, has been, you know, implemented or used within, you know, just a sh short couple number of years, the antibiotic resistance is, is almost immediately reported. So penicillin with, was first commercially available in 1943, but, you know, four years later, penicillin resistance is being described. Um, and similarly, across throughout all the different antibiotics we've ever used throughout all history, within five years, pretty much, any antibiotic that has been implemented is basically acquiring resistance. And this is uh, particularly important because as these antibiotics are, are coming uh, across, are being put into place, um, because the resistance emer is emerging so quickly, you have a situation where you're actually creating a, a really costly effect of, of the, the, these antibiotics. So um, these type of surgical treatments uh, are effectively requiring uh, multiple visits to the hospital where you have um, uh, uh, very expensive procedures as well as um, basically taking people out of work, for example. So you have a large amount of economic and medical costs that 
are associated with this. And so if you start tallying numbers up, just looking at the, at the, the six major escape pathogens that, that were mentioned earlier, um, we're now talking about costs of approaching $5 billion annually just in medical uh, costs of just dealing with these type of infections uh, that are, are taking place. And so what's important to think about also is that it's not just you know, economic and financial costs that are happening, it's that as uh, over time, if this continues, this current trend continues, what we're basically looking at is a situation where the number one killer of, of, of people in general is, is on track to be antibiotic resistant bacteria within the next um, a couple of decades. So hopefully this is something that can actually be addressed and, and changed as we go forward into the future. So one of the questions that always comes up is that, why are we losing our first line antibiotics? How is this happening? Um, and, and then there are, are actually multiple reasons why this, that have led to, to where we are. And some of the, you know, the classic ones that I'm sure many folks have heard um, is the poor public management or inadequate antibiotic stewardship. And, and these are actually, uh, at least in this particular case, we might be able to address this. And, and, and there are a lot of efforts right now to actually move towards helping to fix this particular aspect of, of the cause of this. And, and part of it is the inadequate treatment uh, with uh, appropriate multi-drug reg regimen. So, uh, and, and this is where, you know, the physicians are put in a very tough spot. They want to preserve our antibiotics, but at the same time, they certainly want to save their patients. And so oftentimes they resort to antibiotics that are more broad uh, spectrum that are you know, available immediately that they can use. And, uh, and, and sometimes they don't even know at the time what type of infection it is, what microbe it is. And they certainly don't know immediately whether it's resistant or not. And so this oftentimes leads to, you know, an inappropriate drug regimen um, until they find, okay, it's, dr it's drug resistant, we have to try something else. And they keep going through the, the, this, the, the, the line of drugs that they have available to them. Um, this leads to overprescription, um, unnecessary prescription, or even incorrect prescription simply because they're trying to help their patients um, and not always having the information at hand that they need to assess uh, susceptibility to those, uh, those drugs or even know what the appropriate drug would be um, for the type of infection that they have. Um, another uh, uh, a contributing factor is, is non-compliance of the patient patient to treatment regimen or to lack of supervised treatment. This is usually because oftentimes the, the, the prescription is that you need to take your full, you know, your full, you know, week or, or two weeks of uh, antibiotics. But as soon as the patient starts feeling better, they, they oftentimes will stop taking the drug. Um, and this is particularly true for any of the lines of drugs that that actually have some side effects. They don't want to continue with those, those drugs. And so they will stop their treatments. And this leads to potentially some of the organisms that are, st are still there and can actually gain some resistance um, simply because they survive and they might actually already have some mutations that allow them to tolerate the, the presence of the antibiotics that are there. Um, and of course, you know, Brian already mentioned the overuse of antibiotics and agricultural applications. Uh, we are starting to address some of this now. There's, there's, there is some, some rules that are coming uh, on play to, to curb this, but then it, there's still practices that uh, when you have a herd of 100,000 animals, um, you, there's a lot, and, and, there, and some of them are sick, and you want to make sure nobody, and, and all the rest don't get sick. That's a lot of antibiotics that you're administering, uh, even for you know, legitimate cause, uh, uh, causes. And so there's a lot that's being in, in, released into the environment. Um, and then, of course, uh, in some areas, you might have substandard quality of drugs that are being provided, and certainly in some parts of the world, um, as well as um, maybe limited or, or interrupted drug supplies. And so, again, 
some of these issues in terms of access to the appropriate drugs is, is uh, limitations that we sometimes run into. Um, we're also, uh, at the same time, while all of this is happening, we are also, the pipeline of drugs is actually uh, decreasing. And part of this is because the drug companies are realizing that this is a losing battle for them. This is not profitable at all for them to invest tremendous amount of money into. So they're feeling that uh, that the, the they're not getting enough return on the investments. And as a consequence, uh, they're not working on it. And you can see here from a report um, that, you know, where once we had as many as 18 different companies working, researching antibiotics, um, they, uh, you know, just even a decade ago, uh, uh, they're now down to about four or so. Um, and, and as a consequence, the number of, of uh, antibiotics that are getting approved are really diminishing. In fact, in 2017, there were only 12 that had been approved and only two of those uh, were actually new, uh, uh, completely new drugs. Most all of the others were just derivatives of existing ones. And so this is leading to a, a huge dilemma um, in that the process of, may, of bringing a drug to trial uh, and to, to then market is incredibly long. It's very labor intensive and it's very expensive and it's getting more expensive. Um, and uh, companies are just feeling that the return on investment is just too little. So if you just take in consideration that um, a, a lot of the effort, uh, particularly ones that, you know, where, where the cost is a little bit lower, where you actually get to a drug that might be a good candidate, bringing it to the next stage where it's being tested for safety and for efficacy, and then bringing it actually to a state where it's viable option in terms of a, a marketable drug, we're talking about at least $1.5 billion per drug. Um, and of course, uh, I've been told that this number is on the low side right now, but uh, that's still a lot of investment that a company needs to put in. And these companies have a living to make. They, they, they're not there for, the, uh, to, you know, um, uh, for charity. They are actually trying to make a profit and they have to get a return on this enormous investment. And when you are dealing with an antibiotic that is not always, like, it's not a, a thing that you take daily. You only have short, cases uh, each time, the, and the amount of money that, that um, you can ask someone to, to pay for the drugs that, that are on the market, it's just not worth their efforts. Um, and they're feeling that. Um, and so with that in mind, something needs to be done. Yeah, so one thing that I think, it, it, when we hear this kind of cost of how much it takes to, to produce an antibiotic, uh, there's kind of an unfortunate thing where people are like, well, if, if uh, antimicrobial resistance is costing us $5 billion annually, and each new drug costs $1 billion, well, do we even really need to, to bother making new antibiotics? And, and I would like to make the case that, you know, there's a lot of cost there in addition to, you know, just this direct financial cost that happens from antibiotic resistance and said, um, there's, you know, a, a lot of modern medicine effectively is, is, and society as a whole is based on the presence and existence of functional effective antibiotics. So in addition to, you know, just infectious disease that we are naturally think about, you know, people getting an infection and getting sick from it, a lot of modern day surgery is entirely dependent on having antibiotics to prevent um, uh, on additional infections that occur. So very routine medical procedures such as like C-section or heart uh, transplant, by, transplants, bypass surgeries, um, any sort of uh, thing where you requires opening up a person to, to get inside there to, do, to fix things. Um, these are basically off the table if you don't have functional antibiotics. Um, similarly, immunosuppressive therapies such as anti-cancer chemotherapy or again, organ transplants, uh, these are things that also require um, a large amount of antibiotics to prevent um, extra infections from occurring. Um, and so basically what, without antibiotics, what you end up in, 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 having is a, a world where um, even very minor injuries or cuts and nicks and scrapes or whatever can, can 
with you know very easily become very life threatening. Um, and in addition to kind of the medical perspective, in reality, a lot of the, our agricultural production that functions at a, an industrial scale really requires having antibiotics to prophylactically treat these animals. So even if you know using antibiotics for, for agriculture causes problems of, of introducing antibiotic resistance, the reality is that we still need to do that. Otherwise, we cannot possibly support our, our ever growing population. So really what we are kind of in a situation is uh, what we have is a situation where there there is absolutely a need to have functional uh, antibiotics and we also need to preserve whatever antibiotics we currently have for as as long as possible. And I think one thing that uh, would be important to kind of note is that so far we, what we've talked about are, are kind of identifying problem uh, problems that have occurred um, and as well as individual like uh, interest groups that are, are involved in this process, but no single group really can, can solve these problems on their own. So the, it's not like you can ask farmers to produce less uh, uh, or to use less antibiotics or doctors to, to use less antibiotics when they're treating them or you ask pharmaceutical companies to just make more antibiotics. It, it's like these type of things will, will never actually happen in, in the real world in a pragmatic situation. So what we really need to do is to come up with uh, solutions where we take into uh, account the motivations and, and needs of various different uh, factors to kind of work together to come up with solutions that actually make sense and are actually functional and practical. In other words, it doesn't matter why we have this problem. It's more what really matters is about um, how do we fix it and how do we come up with ways of addressing it. And so to give kind of an example of, of kind of a, a first step, what we can do is start thinking about, for example, the issue of antibiotic stewardship. So how much antibiotics and what are the appropriate cases we need to use antibiotics? This is a problem that can actually be tackled by multiple different groups coming together and working together. So for example, you can start with researchers are gonna be responsible for kind of investigating and measuring and, and studying what are appropriate antibiotic usage cases and what are appropriate policies and practices that, that need to go into place. And then it's kind of up, uh, incumbent upon educators to then take that research and understanding and knowledge and kind of uh, dis distribute that information to other people, to either um, patients or the general public, to uh, farmers who might be using antibiotics, to clinicians who are going to be prescribing antibiotics, and to, to regulators who are going to be con controlling this, these processes. So it, uh, um, in, in addition to kind of the, these type of uh, uh, policies of, of how to best use the antibiotic, uh, antibiotics, there's also this uh, idea of, well, maybe we can use education as a way of, of convincing people to limit or reduce the, the need and burden for it. Um, and so coming up with new uh, practices that involve uh, preventive medicine, for example, so using good hygiene practices or vaccination or, or good infrastructure to have clean water and good nutrition and healthy lifestyles are all, all cases where we can effectively reduce the, the burden or need for, for using antibiotics um, in conjunction with um, um, using our antibiotics appropriately. And on top of that, I think one thing that we kind of have learned from the, the, uh, the more recent COVID-19 pandemic is that even if there are good practices to be put in place and you try to educate people on them, if there isn't some sort of appropriate incentive put in place to actually get people to follow through with those kind of good practices, people are very reluctant to necessarily engage in them. So it kind of requires at the level of kind of regulation or, or communication or education to kind of work together to come up with a unified solution to get everybody to, to follow on, on these ideas. And of course, this also requires that we actually uh, continue with some of the, the, the approaches that are currently underway um, from uh, both scientists from both academia and industry coming together, working together towards finding new strategies for getting new antibiotics, discovery, you know, the discovering of them, but also taking them the next step. Uh, developing them uh, to the point where they can actually serve as, as um, uh, drugs in, in, in this battle. And, and there's a number of traditional approaches that are already in place. Um, and there's some modern twists to these, uh, particularly 
considering all of the new technologies that we have that allow for automation. So in looking at, say, discovering new chemical diversity, a lot of automation and high throughput, uh, being able to, to even use some of the new uh, computational strategies, the uh, artificial intelligent programs that, that allow for machine learning to help us with finding new ways to get new types of antibiotics. Um, being able to find um, in a lot of the genome sequences of these microbes, new targets that the antibiotics can, can hit that are unique to the microbes and don't also cause toxicity in the host um, that you're trying to treat. Uh, maybe taking some of the old drugs, either repurposing them or discovering the, them uh, in new ways, um, that we could actually uh, have those improved through using some of the, the you know, the structure uh, activity type of relationships and being able to do it using some of our more modern strategies for that. And of course, you know, using, you know, structural um, information that we have that might actually help improve some of the existing ones and, and make them different enough that they can serve as being new uh, antibiotics. And then on top of that, having new formulations and new combinations and uh, it, adding augmenters that allow for enhancing the efficacy of, the, of an existing drug by adding combinations of drugs that actually allow for um, the pers preservation of the ones that are there. All of these strategies are starting to be there. Um, there probably needs to be a little bit more cooperation among the industry um, and researchers so that we have intellectual property issues that have to be dealt with where, where we have drugs that are very different from each other, developed by different companies. We might have to have, have more of the, 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 the collaborative interactions that allow for these new uh, approaches and these new formulations to exist. Um, we also have some very new alternative approaches coming along. And, and this, again, requires researchers from both the academia and industry to actually implement. But they, these are actually not dependent on antibiotics necessarily. So these are alternatives to using antibiotics. So for example, using uh, natural products that might be uh, you know, prebiotics and, and probiotics, food supplements, those kinds of, uh, of types of therapies, uh, looking you know, to improve our microbiomes and, and using microbiome types of therapies to combat uh, uh, getting sick in the first place, but also to help uh, keep uh, any pathogens that might be the, in the environment from actually gaining a foothold uh, in, in our bodies. Um, using uh, you know, viruses that attack bacteria called bacteriophage, using those in therapies that, that actually will eliminate the bacterial load. Um, using more uh, strategies for vaccines or antibody, uh, antibodies that actually will help reduce, again, the, the microbial loads and our exposures to them and help protect our, uh, us, particularly uh, in cases where uh, we have multi-drug resistance that is not treatable. Oftentimes, antibodies are pretty much the only way to actually control those, those microbes in our bodies. Um, and Importantly, um, uh, one strategy is, is, is it, it can, it, and, and this ties into the, the whole idea of being able to have good stewardship and good usage of our antibiotics that we currently have, is have more rapid point of care diagnostics so that we, the physicians will know what needs to be used to treat effectively the infection that they're, they're working with. And the patient will then have, faster recovery because the, the correct antibiotic is being used. Um, and then of course, there are additional uh, newer types of therapies looking at blocking the, the bacteria from being able to even bind in the first place and establish infection or using other microbes like bacteria and viruses that are parasites 
uh, to, to actually eat up the viruses that we have now discovered uh, in the environment, some viruses that eat other viruses and bacteria that eat other bacteria and those sort of things. And, and maybe take advantage of some of those new discoveries to actually find alternatives. Um, but all of this uh, also requires that we coordinate you know, all these stakeholders that we actually help establish guidelines um, and that we increase the, the understanding for the urgency and the scale of this antibiotic crisis. Um, we, we need folks to realize that the pipeline that is trickling now and the, the pool of good antibiotics that we have in hand, it, we're losing them rapidly due to resistance. Um, we basically really want people to understand what is at stake here, the urgency of what needs to be happening, and actually help strengthen partnerships um, that will be able to advise um, uh, and support you know, the, the, the stewardship and usage types of uh, uh, efforts to help um, with uh, policymakers and, and regulatory agencies to understand uh, the, the the types of uh, guidelines that need to be in place. And in order to do that, you really need to have better communication and a little bit more understanding of what, what it need, what is needed for this, and to educate you know, the leaders in these areas uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the best paths forward. And I say paths because it's got to be multiple paths. It's got to be multi-prong. Uh, we can't just do it just doing one thing and focusing on just one strategy. We need to have multiple ones, and they all have to be working simultaneously. Um, and again, you know, when we're talking about regulations and we're talking about the involvement of uh, of getting this forward, it's going to cost a lot. And we have to have some way of incentivizing pharmaceutical industry and others I, I, towards this antibiotic development to bringing the, you know, the, the, the new strategies into play. Um, and, and this requires the support from governments and private investors. Um, it also involves the support of all of the stakeholders. And when I say that, I mean everybody, because we all need to uh, have this global cooperation and financial support. And even those, you know, it, it, for, certainly for, you know, financial support from those that can afford it, but we need to have buy-in from everyone to actually make sure that what is put in place is effective. And so we need to have a good understanding by all players of what is at stake here and helping them all to contribute to this. And, uh, and moving forward, we really need to think about, you know, the pipeline um, and the access uh, to the, the, the drugs and all of this requires new financial solutions. Now, tradition, you know, in the past, and you know, we started with uh, primarily incentives that were based on push. And that is we just dump a lot of money into getting the discovery of the antibiotics, getting the lead compounds with the assumption that, oh, once we have this, then the industry is going to be able to take over and make the development and bring it to the market. And, um, and, and those we have found are, are just not nearly as effective. Um, and then uh, some newer ideas are having pull incentives where we actually are pulling the um, the, the, the industry into this by giving them money uh, uh, to, to actually develop things and bring it to market. And then they get rewards for doing that sort of thing. When what is really needed is probably a combination of both of those. We need to help with the, the initial stage of investment. We need to have pools that allow for, for you know, upfront you know, investments. Um, and we also need to somehow, and this is important because everything that is happening in this cycle of research development costs, upfront public and private investments, this cycle needs to be somehow, you know, detached or delinked, I think some folks have been calling it, from the, uh, the 
return from sales aspect of it because almost all co companies are really going to look for some kind of a profit out of this and it's got to be worth their while or it just isn't going to be you know something that is viable and so in order to do this somehow these you know two cycles these two things need to be um uh delinked um and and we need to have leaders thinking about these and trying to find new approaches and, and transformative models for financing collaboration and um, being able to manage IP issues, the intellectual property issues, as well as production, purchasing, you know, distribution and access to all of these antibiotics. This is, this is needed at a global level. It can't be done top down. It can't be done bottom up. It has to be done as a whole. All stakeholders need to have a voice in this. Um, yeah, and so I think it, when, one thing we want to be careful here is that we're, we're, we're presenting a lot of problems and saying we need a lot of these solutions and it makes maybe it makes it sound like nobody's doing these things. But in reality, there are actually a lot of organizations taking the lead already to push these this kind of actions forward where, where they're investing in um, setting up programs for, for antibiotic research. Um, setting up programs to incentivize these type of, of um, stewardship policies and, and kind of advocating at, at, and uh, for lawmakers to implement rules and regulations that uh, help with these kind of problems. Um, but I think one thing that it's kind of worth noting is that kind of in the wake of the, the pandemic um, for, you know, probably become undeservedly so, but there's been actually a strong erosion in the trust that a lot of the public has for these kind of um, global health organizations um, in terms of what, what their uh, motivations are or what they're capable of, of doing. And I think that's kind of basically incumbent upon these organizations then to kind of counter that by kind of firmly establishing and, and, and being transparent with their actions and kind of advocating for themselves as a way of kind of communicating to the public of their the important role that they are or they're serving and, and what they're actually doing and how they're helping um, how, how they're helping push forward through this, this kind of type of crisis. And I think one example of, of a kind of good thing that uh, some of these organizations are, are now doing is that they're creating uh, reporting structures where they can effectively put a website or a database that are, are present where they can keep track of what they've accomplished, what they've done, what are the types of legislations that are being implemented in various different countries and, and where there are certain more efforts need to be directed. So as in a way, it's a, effectively a mechanism for, for the public or people uh, uh, in, in general to kind of hold their, their lawmakers and hold these organizations accountable for, for what they're doing. Doing and kind of pushing forward as we work together for um, for coming up with solutions and going forward into the future. And so with that, I think we're probably going to start wrapping up here. But a couple major take home points that we'd like to uh, emphasize here is that uh, hopefully we've convinced you that basically everybody is is a stakeholder. And even if they're wearing multiple different hats, at the end of the day, all people are going to be going to be directly impacted by uh, the, the presence of antimicrobial resistance and that we need to take care of it. Um, no individual interest group or stakeholder is going to be able to solve the problem because, well, they haven't already, for example. Uh, but what's really needed is for these different interest groups to kind of work together to, to come up with solutions that make sense and are practical and, and, and pragmatic in terms of uh, pushing forward. Um, but these type of solutions require understanding of each other's perspectives, right? So if you were constantly being cynical about whether or not another group's actually trying to serve the best interest of, of everybody as a whole, you're never going to be able to come to an agreement upon what type of policy needs to be put in place. Um, and so as, and, you know, kind of as corollary to that, what really is needed is that all of these solutions are going to require um, active buy-in from everybody. And basically everybody has to be on board with these solutions. Otherwise, they're, they're not going to work. And so I think an important part of that is also listening to, to the public. So and we've been here you know, talking a bunch of things, but I think it's also important for what we can take into account what, what you guys have to say. And, and to, to that end, I think um, we'd like to be able to answer some any of your kind of questions if you post them in the Q&A and we'll try to address as many as we can. All right, thank you so much, Brenda and Brian. 
Uh, and Brenda and Brian, if you see any in the Q&A chat that you particularly want to address, because we've certainly gotten a lot of questions here, um, we're going to try to get to as many as possible. And I'm going to sort of synthesize a few that I've been seeing a recurring theme on. So uh, Brendan, Brian, you touched a bit on alternative approaches such as uh, bacteriophage therapy. So there's been a lot of interest in that in the chat. Can you comment on it? And particularly sort of if you have a feel about what the general public's reception is and how effective slash how far along things are with that uh, alternative therapy. I, I guess I can take that to start with. Um, uh, it, it's actually coming a long ways, um, certainly for more topical types of infections. So um, that you know, it's it's very effective in being able to uh, clear infections, very targeted ones. So in most of these cases, the bacteriophages that are being developed are are specific for certain type of bacteria. So not everyone, uh, all, not all bacteria. Um, and most of the targets have been those for infections that are more topical, strep, throat, maybe a wound infections, where you would spray it on the on the wound uh, or put it into a, a topical cream of, of some sort. Those are actually pretty far along. Um, they're certainly in, in clinical trials now, um, and and they're very effective. However, we, we, there are caveats here. So uh, there is some, some questions about how uh, dangerous it might be to inject a, you know, a phage into, into a bloodstream of an individual, all right? Um, and, and those things need to be worked out still. And, and I think that there are a lot of efforts towards that. There have been some reported success cases for this, especially in you know, very dire situations where people have tried it, 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 it as an emergency treatment. Um, uh, and, and so I think that there's going to be some movement in that that actually might, and, and it's very promising, particularly for certain types of infections. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be effective for all types of infections because um, it's going to be very targeted for particular types um, of that. I don't know, Brendan, Brian, do you have anything yeah, else just, to say? Just to kind of reinforce that idea there is that I think one of the major needs that we have is uh, for broad spectrum antibiotics, simply because oftentimes when a patient comes in to the hospital with some sort of bacterial infection, uh, typically the, the clock is ticking. I mean, effectively, you have to be able to identify what type of ba and a bacteria is causing the disease and deal with it really quickly. Otherwise, once you go septic, you're basically in the you're in life-threatening situation very quickly. And so to that end, if you have uh, antibiotic therapies or treatments, therapies that are very, very targeted or species specific, um, oftentimes you don't necessarily have a, enough time to, to figure out what's the right one to use at, at any given moment. Um, but at the same time, um, there are also some infections, for example, you know, so the topical ones that where you don't have to, or the pressure isn't quite as on. So maybe we can use these to kind of relieve the, the antibiotic burden of the, your, your more general broad spectrum antibiotics by using these kind of more directed therapies. Um, but I think coming up with these type of therapies is, is an area of, I think, active research. I mean, my own research group is kind of investigating ways in which bacteria kind of compete and fight with each other and interact with each other. And so the, the natural extension of that is, can we use the kind of interbacterial antagonism that kind of exists in nature as a way of using it in, as an alternative to antibiotics? Um, so this is definitely an area of like very active research. That's kind of a, a big thing that's going on right now. Great, thank you. Uh, next question I have here is, uh, can you comment a little bit on the Pasteur Act that's before the United States Congress? Does it do enough of what you suggest or what doesn't it do well enough? Um, I think it, 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 I think it's a great idea. So I, I think it actually is a good step forward. It, it actually encompasses the, so the Pasteur Act actually is asking for um, shared burden of supporting um, the, the push and pull type of incentives for getting industry into the, into the arena. Um, uh, it, uh, and, it, and it goes a long ways. Uh, I don't think it's probably quite as extreme as what might be necessary, but one of the big problems with it, and this is what uh, uh, has happened is, is the cost. 
it's going, it, it requires that globally, all of the major players in the antibiotic crisis participate in this. And there's already buy-in from, from a number of large organizations worldwide um, that are contributing to this and, and, and governments are contributing to this. And now it is before our Congress to actually think about trying to do that also. So the, um, it, and it's going to really, it's going to be expensive. And I think that is really where the big hang up is. Yeah, one, one issue I think when it comes to costs that we kind of, there's a mental barrier that I think we need to kind of overcome. And, and that's this idea that, well, if we foot the bill for it, we need to, we should be able to control it. We should be able to regulate it. It should be our, ours to deal with. And I think the, the problem with that is that, well, you know, antibiotic resistance doesn't, isn't just a uniquely us problem, right? It's, it's literally everybody around the world. And so if you have a situation where there are people, you know, who can't afford to contribute to this process, it's still, you know, it's beneficial to everybody to, to still help them out no matter what. And so there's going to be a lot of political negotiation that's going to also have to come into play in terms of um, who's footing the bill, who's uh, benefiting from it, but then also um, making sure that people are abiding by kind of the stewardship practices that are also going to need to accompany it and, and going forward in terms of usage. So it's, it's, it's definitely a very challenging thing. And I think the best thing that we can do at, at our level is kind of educate people on the need for kind of working together and uh, solving these type of problems. And, and hopefully, um, you know, the, the guys in charge can make the right decisions in terms of um, going forward. Yeah, and unfortunately, what really happens is we, we are, because the, the cost that is involved in a lot of these measures, and, and, and this is a plague that we've had now for a long time in the infectious disease arena, is that we're very reactive and responsive to crisis. We, because that's where we, we, we target the, the, the resources, the monies. Um, we just are not able because we don't have those resources to proactively engage and proactively do things that might benefit us 10 years from now when we have crises right this minute that need to be handled. And so I think, and, and part of these kinds of incentives that you would have um, up for, are, are upfront costs that are, is a steep ticket. Um, and so when we have other types of, of obligations and debts that we need to make, how do we make those choices? And convincing people of uh, that there's, there's a looming crisis that's coming up is uh, harder to sell than the one that is right here now. Um, and, and, and that's part of the reluctance that one sees in, being in, in, in investing in these sorts of things. All right, we're almost at time. So I'm gonna finish with just one question that um, I'm synthesizing from a few, which is sort of the idea that there's a, an, an, a focus mostly on infectious diseases and in humans. Um, can you comment a little bit about uh, the veterinary and, and agriculture world a little bit more? Brian, do you wanna take it or I can? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think one thing to keep in mind here is, so I mean, I kind of my, my source of getting interested in all these things was that I had a student who was just very, very adamant and very, very convinced that the, the cause of all our antibiotic resistance from crises was, was farmers. And it was like really, really adamant that blame it's all the farmers fault for doing this. And so it's all the problem. And, and I, I think that's like kind of misguided. And because in re the reality is, is that, you know, our type of in, agricultural industry requires the use of antibiotics. Otherwise people would just be starving, right? So it's not like you can stop using them. Um, and so you, I think what really the solution is gonna come down to is, uh, is making sure that we are aware of what kind of antibiotics are being used and we are managing and regulating what type of, how much we're actually using and kind of uh, also implementing kind of surveillance of keeping track of what the downstream consequences of using them are. Um, and so I think that's really all we can do. And um, obviously getting buy-in across around the world because it's, you know, agriculture is happening everywhere. Um, and I think one push that I think a lot of 
places are, are now starting to try to invest in is um, the idea of antibiotic alternatives. So using phage therapy, using probiotics, using whatever type of thing. These are approaches that are applicable to, to agriculture as well. And, and hopefully going forward, you know, we'll be able to come up with better solutions as, uh, as uh, yeah. Right. And I think one of the other things that folks don't often realize is that some of the antibiotics that are being used in agriculture um, actually have very strong homologs or, you know, analogous ones that are in, in human use. And so when you get resistance to the ones that in agriculture, the resistance that against those that develops can also impact the drugs that we use for humans. And I think that's where, where some of the biggest concern uh, came in, because even though they were called different things, the resistance that emerged from using them was more or less the same. And so knowing what those antibiotics are, knowing what is, you know, how to control them and understanding what the potential other consequence or impacts might be will be very useful and helpful. And I think that, um, you know, again, forging forward in ways that of practices that actually would be helpful in terms of reducing the burden, reducing the need for the antibiotics probably is going to be a way that we need to go forward. And I know uh, you go into that a lot more in the book, which we have uh, that link up to on the page right now. Uh, so we've run right up against the time. So I just wanna thank Dr. Wilson and Dr. Ho for today's excellent discussion. And I'd like to thank the audience for all those thoughtful questions that you sent in and for taking the time to join us today. And with that, we're gonna close out our webinar. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.